I am your host of Across Generations, Tiffany D. Cross, and this is the only place where you will hear three different perspectives from three distinct generations of Black women, and I'm so thrilled to invite you to this conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited. I am your host, Tiffany D. Cross. Now, this is the only place where you will hear three different perspectives from three distinct generations of Black women. Now, I have to say it has been quite a year. So for those who don't know me, I actually used to host a top-rated show at a leading cable news network. And on this show, I was very intentional about censoring the rising majority of the country. That's Asian American Pacific Islanders, Latinos, African Americans, of course, and the indigenous community. Now, naturally, this caught the ire of former Fox News hosts like Bill O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson, and Megyn Kelly. And respectively, this trio of thirsty has began attacking me, making me their platform, uh, which brought out right-wing zealots, as you might imagine. Now, the network where I worked said nothing. Then just a few weeks later, my show was abruptly canceled just days before the midterm elections. And then what happened was a very public battle. This particular network led a very public smear campaign against me, saying all types of ridiculous falsehoods. And I was advised by counsel at the time to stay quiet. Well, I am very pleased to say I am quiet no more. This past year has landed me right here on this very platform. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how this platform came to be. And to do that, I have to tell you about someone who was very, very special to me. She was bred in the South, Atlanta, Georgia, to be exact. She had caramel skin, hazel eyes, a curvy frame, defined cheeks, and a beautiful smile. She was a fashionista, turning skirts and dresses and church hats and heels into really a sartorial legacy. I, of course, I'm talking about my grandmother. As a child, I would sit at her table, constantly watching her, taking in every frame of her being, the lines that creased her face, the way she would bite her lip while she cooked, the way she would wear various aprons tied at her waist, I took it all in. I sat at that table serving as her sous chef, and she showed me how to dice onions and chop peppers and what the consistency of dressing should look like before you put it in the oven. Never using a measuring cup, she taught me what a pinch of this and a dash of that looked like. I know a lot of you guys can relate. Her hands, which always felt like silk to me, would grab cast iron skillets from the stovetops and pans directly out the oven, never needing oven mitts magically. So I sat at that table and took her in, and I was weaned in the ways of a Southern Baptist woman with a past unspoken. She embodied her decades of wisdom while pouring into me lessons. How to live, how to love, how to be a lady, how to be a woman, how to carry grief, how to harness joy. Gladys Story Read my grandmother. It just made me believe Black women are oracles. We embody this legacy, the elders, the women who were us before us. This is an invocation and an invitation. Young women being groomed in the ways of life. We're all we have. We are unique. We contain stories only we understand. Only we know our secrets. We speak a language you can't even learn by osmosis. Sage stories passed in the wind, and if we don't tell our stories, who will? So come with me. I invite the young to come learn from the elders. I invite the elders to find learning in the youth. Join hands with us and chain this soul and embrace our unique wisdom that stretches across generations. We have joining us the very young and beautiful Nyla Simone. She's 28 years old. She is a superstar in her own right. She's also a podcaster and a DJ. You may have seen her on The Breakfast Club, Comedy Central's Hell of a Week, or on her very own podcast, We Need to Talk. And on the younger side of our (laughs) season elders, we have the amazing, beautiful Latasha Brown. Latasha is a political strategist, an institution builder, and a visionary. And I use that term visionary in so many ways. Uh, She is a visionary well beyond politics. She's certainly been a visionary over my life, but really a visionary over uh, women, humanity, love, and all the things. So I am thrilled to welcome you both here. And I think it is time that we come together as Black women and have this conversation. What is our state of being right now? So I'll kick it off with you, Latasha. Um, You know I love you and the great respect I have for you. 
So I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on what exactly is the state of Black women as you see it? You know, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about how I would answer it um, when you raised it um, in, in your introduction. I was thinking to myself, we are everything, all things, and everywhere at the same time mm -hmm. in terms of even when I think about the state of being you know, what does it mean in terms of this identity of a black woman? And it and there's this 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 quote that talks about we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And so much of our time is to force us in this box around what our identity is mm -hmm. and to label that identity as if we don't have the fullness of all aspects of humanity mm -hmm. to express ourselves. And so there's a certain way of being, I think, that black women um, embody part of it is, is informed by culture and experience. Some of it is informed by who we are, our presence in the world, how just our presence actually challenges um, white supremacy mm -hmm. and patriarchy. You know, but when I think about, you know, what our state is, there are many states that we are, um, we are the fullness. I think that there's an aspect of the fullness of humanity that you can find in black women mm -hmm. in different aspects. And so whether... You know, we're talking about the sister who is in the South that is making $6 an hour trying to feed her children, or whether you're talking about the sister on Wall Street, or if we're talking about a sister in Brazil, right, right who is uh, working to run for public office, I think there's a, there's a sense of we represent, I think, the fullness. There's a snapshot and a microcosm of, of, I think, all living things that you can find in black women. That's so beautiful. We we birthed humanity. We birthed some would humanity. argue. So it makes sense that you would find us in all of humanity. I think that's why we have such a deep touching relationship to humanity. Um, we'll get back to you, but I have to say you embody that humanity more mm -hmm. than anyone I know. I often say Latasha is walking, talking, breathing definition of love. Um, Nyla, you um I think you represent the the future in, in so many ways. Um, you know, being an, an influencer in your own right, um, having very honest takes um, and very honest observations in society. So I'm curious, being a 20 something, what is the state of black women as you see it? Um, when you said it, I really didn't know how to answer that question either. But one word that just constantly came to my mind was just resilient. Like, mm. I feel like more than anything for myself or even, you know, when I go home because it was just Thanksgiving and I'm talking to my mom and my grandma, it's just resiliency because I know, like, when I'm telling them the things that I'm going through, they can't even fathom having that opportunity to do the things that I am doing or to have the freedom to wear my hair the way I'm wearing it or, you know what I mean, like, just my interaction. So for me, I think it's just resiliency because I feel like what I'm doing or just even just having a voice it's not just for me. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's for all of us. Right. It's for what you wish you could have said, but the times wouldn't have allowed it. You know That's what right. I mean? Right. So I think the state of black woman is just resiliency, but then also like, though there's a lot that we need to work through, we should really like give ourselves a break because we're doing damn good. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Give ourselves a break. You know, I think the, the state of our individual being is the state of our collective being. You could not sit here and be experiencing hardship and we not feel it. That's right. You could not be sitting here and feel sadness and we not feel compelled to offer comfort. I think it is um, our superpower in community. I think we can have spaces together and where we go, the world follows. Uh, not just in America, but our influence cast a wide net of influence across this entire globe. And so when I think of us in terms of how we're treated, how we're loved, um, so much of it comes, it's, it's, um, it's our intra um, relationships that we have with each other. And I don't know what I did in a previous life to be so blessed to be born a black woman. I literally would not choose anything else. Me too. Don't you just I, love it? I, I, I love it. <laughs> I don't, I, love it. I don't know another group of people who have this. I agree. This. I really don't. Right. It's three of us talking here, and we invite everybody to tune That's in. That's right. But yeah. we are talking to each other and for each other. There are things that we can say that only we will understand. Absolutely. And you invite one person outside of this group, and the whole vibe changes. The whole conversation changes. The whole spirit changes. So it's something magical that happens when we come together uh, and have these, these types of conversations. Now, 
I do have to say, um, I think there are challenges oh, with absolutely. us as absolutely. well. And there's a lot of healing uh, to happen. And you know, even in my personal space, I know I have healing to do. We carry trauma from our ancestors. We bore the bruises and babies of our oppressors. And we are carrying all that still. Um, is there an area, Latasha, where you think um, this is the most prominent area where we need to heal? You know, I think it's really interesting because as we're talking about, even going back to your first question, the state of black women, we have to acknowledge that, you know, unfortunately, after centuries and centuries, it seems like the world has just discovered like, oh, look, it's black women. Black right. women are amazing. Right. We've been amazing. Right. Like we've been here. Yeah. Right. This ain't new. Right. You know, um, but I do think that there is, I want to acknowledge that there is this certain space. And I think part of it is because we're seeing what I call we're in this phantom star moment. And this mm -hmm. is what I remember being in school. I remember being in college and I remember the uh, in, in one of my classes, I think it was a astronomy class where the instructor was saying that when you see a star, mm -hmm. um, that m many of the stars, most of the stars that we're seeing in the sky right now have have burned out like hundreds of that, like hundreds of years ago. Mm. Right. That by the time we're seeing them, that they're actually we're just really seeing the residue of the light of the star because it took light years for it to get to us. But that there's a it's a new era that there's other stars that are being born every day. I say that to say I think we're in this space right now that white supremacy and patriarchy is dying. Mm -hmm. Now, it is fighting like hell to survive. Like hell. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is it is dying and there's a transition and there's a shift. And I think part of what has happened in that space, you're seeing black women, like there's a recognition of black women that I don't think is, is, is based because all of a sudden we're doing something different. I think we've always been resilient. I think mm -hmm. we've always been creative and innovative. I think we've always been fly, yeah. right? You know, but I, I think that there is this particular kind of uh, opening that we're seeing right now, whether you say it's in this country, in the West, or I even think in the universe. I think that there's this space that there is, because we, our very presence comes up against um, white male patriarchy, that there's literally an acknowledgement. There's a certain kind of acknowledgement that we're shining and we're yeah. taking advantage of those spaces. You know, and so, you know, I, I, when I think about healing, I think part of, I think our biggest space around healing is really for us to really unpeel this thing, this identity piece. Because the other part of the black womanhood piece is that we've made it mean something. And sometimes in the space of, and hear me out, in the meaning something, we've taken on this box that we've even put ourselves in. Mm. You know, this notion of black women are strong, black women. In some ways, this superhuman kind of context, this paradigm actually keeps us as a disadvantage because also the world treats us as if our humanity is not right, seen. Right. Like, you know, that we have to be strong all the time, that we can't be vulnerable. Yeah. That, you know, and I and 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 part of what I think, if I think there's a space of healing, I think black women should really think about, like I said initially, we're everything and all thing all at the same damn time. Mm -hmm. Right. We should not allow ourselves to be limited or even think of ourselves in a limited way that that our gender or who we are in this this label of being a black woman actually supersedes the fact that I'm a human being. Absolutely. That I'm a human. That beyond my gender, that beyond my race, that I am the spirit of who I am. I am a spiritual being. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where the healing should take place. I think the healing for us to actually connect to kind of that soul and that spirit part of who we are and recognize that in my gender, that's an expression. Mm -hmm. That's how my soul chose to express itself this lifetime, right? right? You know, that this idea of race, that that's how I identify myself, but that's not... The, the totality of who I am. And so I really believe that's the healing. The healing really is in terms of us getting in touch with our identity, right? And really being able to shape that in such a way that we feel empowered and we don't feel limited. Yeah. You know, I, I, I first of all, amen. I, um, I so embody that thought because you, you know, you both know I've spent, um, decades in, in politics and policy and, you know, at this point in life, um, I 
I'm tired of talking about the white man's government. You know, right. I'm tired of navigating white folks' corporate spaces. You know, whether it's actual white faces or black people who carry the water for white folks. Like, I, mm -hmm. I need a break from that. I want to talk to us about us. I want to talk about healing. I want to talk about, I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll talk about politics and, you know, we'll have those discussions. But not here. You know, there has to be a safe space where we can come and have this collective uh, discussion and just take a breath. And this for a while, there was this thought like when people started acknowledging our power and they would say, you know, like black women are going to save us. Here's the secret, boo. We ain't trying to save you. We saving ourselves and you benefit. <laughs> you think we sitting around right. sacrificing ourselves? We ain't some self-sacrificing people sitting around. Well, let me make sure the white man being OK. <laughs> you know, that's not what we're here for. And so I I just love um, for a time such as this for us to come together um, and talk about what do we need from ourselves and for ourselves for us to harness joy in our mm. lives. Um, is there an area where you think we need healing? Definitely. I think something that I would highlight, and this is amongst like women to women, but also women to men relationships, I think it's just grace. Mm. And I feel like um, we just lack understanding whether it's generational or whether it's um, like I said, through opposite sex, mm -hmm. because a lot of times, um, you know, I feel like, or who on the breakfast club, we had Miss Pat on and she like did this whole rant about how my generation only does this and my generation only does that. And I just let her ramble because I have respect for my elders. But at the same time, it's like, you're really just generalizing when your generation had the same group that she was talking about in her generation, you know what I mean? So it's just a people thing. And even if people choose to live their life different than you choose, it's not a wrong or right thing because, you know, everybody's operating at their own level of consciousness. So it's who are you to judge? Mm -hmm. So I think instead of just judging each other or shaming or thinking one's better than the other, we should just offer each other more grace. You mm. know, my grandmother and my mother went through things that I never have to go through, thankfully. But because I know they went through that, I understand why some things might be a trigger or I understand why some things might be uncomfortable for them. And so instead of me just trying to force them to understand, it's like, you know what? I see where you're at. That's where you're at, but just respect where I'm at. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think Absolutely. that's something that we should practice more. I, I need help with that. Um, I think that's such a great point. I, I do, because sometimes my intention is not to judge, but I think um, as someone who's older um, in, in my 40s, my mid 40s, um, I didn't realize I was middle aged, honestly, until somebody <laughs> told me that. But as middle aged, because um, I feel like I'm 25, you know, it goes by so quickly and it's like, but being middle aged, I do find myself, I don't want to turn into one of those like, get off my lawn. But I do find myself looking at some of the um, behavior, um, hearing some of the songs, and it's not judgment, it is pain. I'm like, oh, these younger people are in an incredible amount of pain, or these younger people are being misguided. When I see some of the things I see on Instagram, when I hear some of the conversations. And so I, I'm here respectfully and humbly asking, um, you know, sometimes it feels like younger generations have been reduced to um, titty shots on the gram, you know, <laughs> or, you know, rocking the songs that are utterly disrespectful. Not that we didn't have that either in our generation, you know, right. like we all grow out of it, but it seems more prevalent now with social media. What I mean, what what do you make of that? being of that generation, do I sound judgmental? You know, does this sound like I mean, I'm shaming people? I don't want to, but tell me a better way to communicate some of the things I'm witnessing. And no, about. you're not judging because you're right. It is pretty out there. You yeah. know, like, um, what is, I think, I think Glorilla was online talking about how she had an abortion, but she was just openly talking mm -hmm. about it. Right. So my mom's like, Oh my God, can you believe? And it's <laughs> like, you know, but every, like, every generation has had these things. Every generation has had raunchy music. Every generation. That's right. Millie yeah. Jackson. That's right. Millie Jackson Luke. was one of the raunchy. Luke, Luke. Luke for my generation. Right. Millie Jackson for my generation. Right. Before that. Mom's Mabley. Right. Like, all throughout our history. So, so yeah. I feel like now it's just super amplified and, like, the consumption is just different. Like, yeah. now it's visual. You see it all the time on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, you know, whatever your vice is, you're just constantly being fed that. So, I think that's the difference in, like, just how often you're seeing it. But there really is no difference between the acts to me, mm -hmm. personally. That's fair. You, you know, I, I just want to say, 
I'm judging. I don't mean to say that. Listen, I'm just gonna say it. I'm judging. We gotta be honest. Who does not judge? Yeah. But the truth of the, I, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. But just just hear me out. I, I I don't I don't know if judge. I think there's a part of a human beings that we make an assessment. I think I don't know if the judgment in itself mm-hmm. is and and and, I, and I'll uh, clear up what I mean by that. That judgment in itself. I think it's judgment when you attach that to you assign a value. I think that that's when the problem, when mm-hmm. it becomes a problem, because I think at some level. What do you mean assign a value? Talk us through. I think that there's a. I think that there are ways. For example, I love. I love sister. Now, like young, I'm learning so much from young folks. Mm-hmm. They challenge me daily. Some things challenge me, but there's some things that I think around young women that are literally breaking this thing open. You know that I'm act. That actually I think is really good, and challenges me to think around. Our liberation, but I'm. But I also it it also makes me think about my responsibility as I'm becoming an older woman. What responsibility do I have to teach? Mm-hmm. And I do think that there's a space that we have, which I think this cross generation that has been how we have survived up until this point. We have survived because there was always a role for elders. There was always a role for young people. There was always a role. But for for us, and I think in that, even embedded in that, that we had certain values, that there was some level of judgment that mm-hmm. might be attached to it. Mm-hmm. But there's a there's a, a there's a certain thing that a, a a judgment that you assign a value to that person because of what they're doing. Mm. So because you are working at a um, like my grandma, like you, you may be working as a stripper or a prostitute or call girl or whatever. Now I've assigned that you don't have any value. Mm-hmm. That as a woman, you're not a woman or um, you're this embodiment. That's what I mean about when you actually take judgment and you assign that to value, right? But I do think that there's something, because I want us to be honest around this. And I think even collectively, we also have to think about what's what is good for us to advance us and move us forward? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just remember the other day, and I, I was watching this video, Sexy Red mm-hmm. was on this video, and, and she's pregnant. And she was on the video, and she was, she was, she was twerking. Um, and listen, I'm trying to get somebody to teach me how to twerk, so yeah. I ain't really <laughs> against the twerking on some level, right? Yeah. On some level, right? But, but what the thought came to me, my initial thought, I went through this process, but it wasn't just the twerking. It was almost, I'm looking at this sister, and and she looked uncomfortable on some level to me. On one hand, it was, I was thinking to myself, is she doing that for her, or she's doing that because she thinks that that's what she needs to do to be relevant? Mm. That's important. We can't dismiss that and just say anything goes. That's not how we survive. Right. We would not have survived slavery. We, we would not have survived the Middle Passage. We would not have survived antiquity if it was just anything goes. There has always been a role that we have, I think, to really be able to impart each other in wisdom. And I think it was always a role for young people to actually push us, oh, no, are we changing this? We're shifting that. Yeah. And to me, it's been the balance of that. That's the sweet spot and where we find where the truth is. Mm-hmm. And so I say that because I think Sometimes we're not honest about this idea. Oh, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to say anything. I think that's part of the damn problem. I think part of the problem is this whole context of anything goes. And I'm seeing a little sister do something that really, I'll give an example. I think part of what we're seeing right now with the over-sexualization of of sisters, and I'll tell this, I think that that is in some level part of what we've identified as power and liberation from brothers. Mm. That the, the truth of the matter is like it is almost like um if if I if if the brothers did it for years and they were able to yeah. to objectify um the sexual proudness of themselves and others then there's a whole industry that got created off that, right? Mm-hmm. There was a whole industry that got created off us being reduced to ass and titties, yeah, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, and and I've heard brothers talk about um, sisters around, well, this is what they're doing now. I was like, no, nah, you shut up. If you want to say nothing about Luke and them doing it, mm-hmm. if she going to make some money off her ass and titties, go, go, girl, get your right. check. I yeah. ain't mad at you, right? Yeah. But that's one level of the conversation. But another part of the conversation is why are we deciding that we're going to take on the same map mm-hmm. that others that took that map? It's almost like white folks define black people and now we're just going, because we we take it on, then we're just going to roll that. If brothers defined, if there were men 
that actually define this exploitive image of women. That in itself, because now we're owning that, that that, that in itself makes us powerful. Right. We really need to think deeply about that and what that means. That's I was just having point. this conversation actually with Rhapsody. Rhapsody is a female rapper. She is pretty um, lyrical. She's always covered, you know, very respectful stand-up woman. And she was saying how her pretty much fan base is majority male. And then also when I had Sexy Red on my show, she was telling me that her fan base is also majority male. So and then but the point that me and the conversation that me and Rhapsody were having is that we see other women being up other women to do things like that. It's That's never right. really the men that be gassing up women to That's, like do mm. like men are stand back and watch and enjoy, obviously, but it's other women who are usually gassing up other women to That's do right. provocative things. Why do you think that is? I can't tell you honestly. Like yeah. when we're talking about, it, I'm like that. I think it's interesting because I'll, I'll say this: we are we are layered people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we have sexual sides, we have intellectual sides, we mm -hmm. have uh, caregiver sides. Like mm -hmm. we just have different sides to us. So I feel like I don't have a problem with you know Sexy Red or any of the girls who uh, do what they do because it's entertainment and they get in a check. I do understand what you're saying about, you know what, we need to bring shame back because some of this is just out of pocket. But but <laughs> but what I think the real thing is, is that we just need to have a balance because there's room That's for right. both. That's right. And mm -hmm. we just are not seeing a balance because it's just everybody feels like, well, this is the way. And I've, I've even, like, um, I, I've watched artists who tried to go the straight and narrow get no support, mm -hmm. no money, but then as soon as they turn around and twerk, it's money's thrown, right. you know yeah. what I mean? So I don't even know, I don't want to say it's us who's doing it, because really we're just trying to make money to take care of ourselves and advance our families. So right. it's it's like, a, I don't know. It's, it's another I'll say it's though. us. I don't think it's yeah. just us, because I think some of that has been put on us. I think that's why this identity question is so important. And even the piece around, I think the part around... Um, I, I think all things, I think there's some wisdom. My grandmother used to say, all things have a season, right? I think there's appropriate spaces to twerk, baby. Mm -hmm. like, I, I don't yeah. think nothing wrong with it at all, yeah. right? I think that there, that there are appropriate times. I think, but when we start blurring this line, that there's nothing that is appropriate. There's nothing that's sacred. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that, you know, nothing that is at, at the at, at the end of the day, and this is probably, and and I will say, I'll even probably put my judgment. I No, I know I put my judgment on the, the piece of when I saw the sister dancing while she was pregnant on this stage. I was thinking to myself that part of, and, and by just been my own experience, that when I was pregnant with my child, mm -hmm. I believed that every energy around me was impacting my baby, mm -hmm. right? I believed that there were certain spaces in terms of safety. I wouldn't go to clubs, not necessarily because I didn't want to be in the club. I didn't go to a club because I didn't want anything to happen. That now I am responsible for a human being mm -hmm. that I'm nurturing in my body. Do we not understand yeah. how fly that is? That we're literally creating a whole nother human being and that we're bringing into this energy in this world. And so for me, I think what bothered me is that there's, there's something even around um, uh, uh, the sacredness of really being able to bring life through our bodies mm -hmm. and not and, and have a disconnect that we are actually caring and responsible for that life. I think that bothered me more than the, just the act itself. It, it's it's a I can't I couldn't do the same things when I was pregnant. Right. That I did what I wasn't pregnant, and I'm seeing that be different. All right. So on every episode of Across Generations, we want you to be part of the conversation. We want to know what y'all saying in the streets. So for this particular episode, the streets are talking and we want to throw the mic to Ari Lennox, who was recently doing uh, a live video where she talked about um, her nose. So we'll take a listen to this clip and we'll talk about it on the other side. And some girl in the comment was like, it's going to be a great day when she really starts liking herself. And I was like, how could she Hell, I had doubts about myself through me being triggered by Maury saying what he said about this man. So I felt a way like, bitch, like, what the, why does that have to, what's that supposed to mean? Sometimes not feeling like I belong. I was hanging out with someone and they mentioned like how certain sometimes when celebrities change their appearance like how much their money changes and how opportunity changes and all these things like that 
and the person basically was like yo like the same thing probably would happen to you and i was just like jesus so it's like a lot of it's a lot of things that have happened ever since i've i've became a singer because there would be little things growing up like tunnel nose all that shit. but like becoming like a singer that was signed it just seems like all of your in all of my insecurities just became heightened all right so you heard what Ari Lennox um had to say and um I, I she's a beautiful woman I think you you've met her you know her you've interviewed her what, what's your take I love Ari and I hate that Twitter or the internet in general paints narratives about Ari or how she looks. I think she's beautiful. I've always thought she was beautiful. And I think Ari is actually a perfect example of somebody who has to represent for us. Because when I see Ari, I see me. Mm -hmm. So I'm always championing Ari. And yeah, yeah. Wh whoever the guy is right, though. The moment she starts loving herself, the moment. And I think we've seen it, though, because mm -hmm. now she's fit. She's on stage. Like, I love seeing her um, go from zero to 100 and argue with that fan who threw a bottle at her. Like, I, I don't know. I love Ari. I love her, too. Yeah. And I, I will say, um, what really pisses me off is when we have these negative comments about our edges, our nose, our lips, it ain't coming from white folks. The call is coming from inside the house. And mm -hmm. that level of self-hate. Now, I do think that level of self-hate does directly come from the um, o oppressor. But I, we carry that. And I want That's us right. to stop carrying that message. Like see our beauty you know that's see right. see so if your edges ain't smooth that's how you were born that's, right. that's the roots that's the ancestors reaching across generations <laughs> right. reaching through you saying i'm here let that kink be your that's superpower right. and be proud that's of that right. kink right. you know um why do you think that is sasha and what can we do to get out of that you know i think part of it is we're literally trying to have a conversation on a level that's so low mm -hmm. that we're stuck in the mud around it, right? And I think part of that mud has been created in an environment that actually lifts up white supremacy, mm -hmm. regardless of what we say, we're in that space. I think the way that we actually have to deal with it is you got to rise above it. And so I always talk about, you got to levitate. What mm -hmm. does that mean? That means sometimes you've got to actually, that's what I think is really important when we're saying self-love, uh, to, to young girls that I work with and th that I work with even through my organization, Southern Black Girls, part of it is to actually start thinking about you have the getting young girls to think about your identity is not set with somebody else defining it, mm -hmm. right? Um, no more than the identity of black women should be set in the context of other people defining it, but that we should define it. And I think even in this case, that on one hand, I am so sorry that, that this sister has to go through this because she's absolutely beautiful. The good thing is... I think it's sometimes in those moments, that's when the breakthrough happens. Yeah. Because in order for her to move past that, she's got to levitate. She's going to have to go to another level and love herself at a level that's so deep that none of that stuff they're saying. You know, I always, I love this notion of, I love what Beyonce does. Like one of the things that Beyonce does is you could talk about Beyonce and uh, like a dog. Beyonce is not going to say a word, mm -hmm. right? That it's on some level, I'm, I'm raising that because I think that there's something about literally owning yourself and your own power that what people say about you ain't none of your business, mm -hmm. that you are able to levitate and go to the next level. And I think, but I think that takes a community supporting that which is what I think women do with each other and black women do with each other. And I think that's why it's so harmful and dangerous that when we're out of pocket and we're tearing each other down, it has a different kind of impact. When a sister hurts me, you know, a sister or brother hurts me, you know, it's like, to, it's like, it's to the core. Yeah. Right. But there's something. So I, I believe that. Because we don't expect it. Because you don't yeah. expect it. I expect it right. from other folks. That's I right. don't mm -hmm. expect it from my, my, right. my people. No, yeah. not at all. So I'm hoping that this sister recognizes, yes, there's an industry standard, but we ain't never been a part of that industry standard. Yeah. Right. Your very presence, her very presence is shifting what that identity looks like. Right. Yep. I want her to own that because there's power in that. I want her to own that there is a conversation right now about her nose. She, like at the end of the day, yeah, there's a conversation with my nose that in the owning of my nose, I can have other black, hundreds and thousands of other black girls owning their nose. So to see the power, like flip that thing, that what was meant to hurt you and harm you, use that to elevate you. I will say for my own experience um, being a black woman, I have mostly been unapologetic about it, about how I show up. When um, I had my television show, 
I dressed how I wanted to dress. I talked about what I wanted to talk about. I attended the HBCU. We were taught to love ourselves. You know, grew up in Atlanta. I'm born in Cleveland, so spent some years there. But for the bulk of my life, I was in Atlanta. That's a black ass city with black ass people around it. Is you know, it's a beautiful thing. And so I, um, there were times where. Um, my my question on who I was was not centered on white folks' thoughts and opinions of me. Um, my features for, you know, I, I celebrated my features. My my experience has not been one to have shame um, about my body. But I'm curious from you all. I mean, we're sitting here with these beautiful women. Nyla, you have your hair done in a very ethnic way. You look you always look beautiful, but you also always wear your hair very natural. Latasha, you look gorgeous. You've worn your hair natural. You look beautiful with that hair. You look beautiful with this hair. I, I, I'm sitting here surrounded by beauty. And I might have me some more hair tomorrow. <laughs> As you should. Because I'm a As black woman. You should. <laughs> I had a guy, I had a co-worker. He worked in IT and he used to call me the girl with many hairstyles. That's right. And it used to piss me <laughs> off because he was white and he just... Oh. He would forget my name because I always came in with a different hairstyle. So he yeah. would just be like, oh, the girl with many hairstyle. And it's like, actually, you know, my name is Nyla. And right. yes, I like right. to switch my right. hair up, you know. But Have uh, we said that to you, though, it would be different. That's what I mean about our community. Yes. Like, you ain't earned the right to even joke with me like that. Exactly. My name is Nyla. Maybe Miss Simone, depending on how old you are. <laughs> no, for real. I'm not the girl with many hairstyles for you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because that was when I was working with a primarily white company but then when I started working on Charlemagne's show and he has like an all female black staff so I walk into work and they're like oh my god the afro is so cute today or your mm -hmm. twist out came right. out good and I walk, I would walk in feeling like oh wow like I'm so happy to be here it's just different than being called like oh the girl with many hairstyles what's the it's like a yeah. different approach yeah um, well we can't trust the intention behind it because somebody who looked like him was responsible for you know, beating and berating the humanity out of us sometimes. It's not so funny when you say the girl was many hairstyles, when you define me that way. Yeah. Uh, even though his intentions may have been, he could have said that to a white, but like y'all keep that in your community. You know, like mm -hmm. don't joke with, don't, don't joke like that with me. Um, not being a member of the community. That's kind of how I feel about it. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't play like that. But well, I'm sorry. What was your question? I got triggered and I thought about well, that. <laughs> I understand. I would be triggered too. But basically how you show up in the world unapologetically. And like, do, do uh, you ever feel like, oh, maybe if I straightened my hair or maybe if I mm -hmm. looked a, a different way? Oh, um, ah. Uh, I did straighten my hair. I kind of, we're you know, we're black right. women. We're versatile. We do a little yeah. bit of everything. But I do thoroughly enjoy wearing ethnic hairstyles, and I definitely love wearing my afro just because it's me, and I feel like we need to get conditioned to love me for me. Gosh. You know yeah. what I mean? So during the pandemic, I actually, like, was just going through a quarter-life crisis. I cut off all my hair, and I kept forgetting that I cut off all my hair. So I would wake up in the morning, see myself, and, like, be shocked. Like, I would cry. Mm. And even my dad was so heated that I cut You know how black fathers are. Yeah. Like, you cut your hair. What's going on with you? Da, 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 da. So he was no help. But nonetheless, in me cutting my hair, it really forced me to love, like, the real me, mm. regardless right. of what I look like, regardless of how long my hair was. Yeah. You know, so um, I'm really thankful that I did it. Because it, it taught me how to take care of my hair. You know, it's just different from, like, going from a kid to an adult. and An adult version of you, you kind of have to reset because you're a whole new person. Yeah. So, um... And, and it's something about being young, too. Like, your mm -hmm. generation has that, um, the, the privilege of being able to do that. Yes. It was uh, h harder in the 80s and, and the 90s. I mean, you remember Boomerang right. and Robin Gibbons with the big hair. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a different time. You also didn't see women on television looking like that, you know? Know, every woman had to have like the same kind of anchor hairstyle. Um, and, and there's literally been laws instituted uh, around things like that. So it's had to change. You know, I think and when I think of my own, um, and this goes back to the kind of identity, there's been three things that um, I've had to contend with. Um, it's been about my complexion. Um, part of it is because my mother is a very, very, was a, a, is a very, very fair woman. My grandfather's half white, and so my mother was very, very light complected with fine hair. I had big bushy hair um, and dark complected. Um, I think it's always been skin color. It's always been hair. It's always been something connected to my hair, and it's been body. 
It's been what your body image is. Mm. And so, and I remember that even from a child on up. And there's two stories that come to mind to me. The first one is I remember being in um, uh, first grade, and this had to be, I remember the Marvin Gaye song, um, keep on moving, got to give it up, got mm-hmm. to give it up. Uh, and I remember uh, going down, we would have May Day, and I was in first grade, and we were going out May Day, and my mother and my aunt got together, and I always had a lot of hair um, and a big old afro, and they got together. I was a skinny little kid, and they, for some reason, they decided to put some ribbons, some uh, yellow ribbons in my hair, and I looked in the mirror, and I thought I looked like a lollipop, mm. and I was like, I just... Look now, but I'm a, I'm a kid, mm-hmm. so I've got to go down this this. It was a Soul Train line, so we're getting ready to go down the Soul Train line, and I'm going down the Soul Train line, and I want to die because I'm this little chocolate child going down the Soul Train line with this big old afro, and I look like a lollipop. Mm-hmm. And I'm going down the Soul Train line. There were two sisters, two older women that were standing on the side, and one of them said, "She." Look at this little chocolate drop with all that hair. She's so cute. She's so pretty. And baby, I almost broke my back. I, my, <laughs> I completely shifted and showed out in that moment. To this day, and I'm 53 years old, to this moment, this day, when I am having a bad hair day or I don't feel pretty, I swear I pulled from, I remember those two sisters that I don't know if I ever saw again, mm-hmm. but there was something about they affirmed my skin in that moment. Um, there's something about they affirmed that I was cute with this big old bushy hair, mm-hmm. right? And so something about that I was able to draw from. And, you know, the, the next story was interesting because of that. I went through this whole piece um, when I turned, I think I was around 22, when I turned 22, that I was like, I was going, I went all natural. And I was actually natural for 20 years, right? Well, I'm still natural, kind of, sort of, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, so I, I went natural, and I remember I first gone natural, and I was on the, t- uh, the campus of Tuskegee, and there was this brother, uh, one of my Uhuru brothers, I say, I called, that was on campus, and I was an activist, and I remember he coming up to me, and he was like, yeah, sister, you know, I'm so glad, look at you with your hair, and he was giving me all of this love, but he tempered it, Saying it with, yeah, you ain't like these sisters out here that ain't that got perms and X Y Z. That's immediately where I was like, what? Yeah, wait, exactly. What you mean? Yeah. Um, and to the point where I remember looking at him, saying to him, like, wait a minute, you, what you saying to me makes me think that you don't love black folk, right? Right. Because my mama got 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 weed right now. So what right. you what you saying to me, right? That and so. It was almost like at that moment was a turning moment for my life that I I gave myself permission that if I want to rock braids, if I want to rock a a natural, if I want to rock weave, whatever the case may be, that I had the freedom to do that. I wouldn't let others define me. Yeah, I I think that's so um, that's so powerful because, you know, sometimes we have to remind um, other people and ourselves, you don't have to knock another woman's crown off no. to make the next sister shine brighter, mm-hmm. you know, and that that bothers me. But this is an interesting point, too, that I think we we have to talk about um, in, in the state of black women, and that is the state of black men. You know, what is the state of our relationships with our, our mm-hmm. counterparts? Because um, that's certainly a part of our existence. And I don't mean just romantically. I mean with our brothers, with our fathers, with our uncles, with the you know, sons, grandsons, you're raising your, your grandson. Um, what is our role and responsibility because we are such a powerfully a connected community? Um, what is our role and responsibility when it comes to our counterparts? Mm. It's a work in progress for me, at least yeah. romantically. You know, I'm learning every day um, with my partner, adjusting and trying to figure things out. But I will say, you know, as a daughter and as like a niece, um, I do allow men to lead me the same way I allow women to lead me. So I don't like favor one or the other. And I actually really do try to take what they say um, and understand it. Because naturally, like if I explain something to you guys, like, hey, I'm going through this, you guys will get it and you guys will comfort me and make me feel, you know, better and mm-hmm. not alone. Where like if I go to like my dad or like my uncle, they're going to tell me, probably a little more on the straight and narrow, less without the emotion. And I think both are important. Mm -hmm. So I think um, 
the state of the black man versus the with the relationship of the state of the black woman. If you leave it up to Twitter, it's in hell and hot water. <laughs> but I think like <laughs> but I think in real life, you know, it's important to to be led by one another because feminine and masculine energy is equally important. Yeah. yeah. I, I would agree with that. Um and again, it doesn't have to be romantic, you know, relationships. Like we um I have a brother, I have nephews, you know, I date men, obviously. Um, I have a lot of, you know, close guy friends. Um, and I think for, for my generation and, you know, at this point in life, um, we are all going through the process of getting older, you know, um, of looking, we were joking. This, this might not be as funny to you, Nyla, but it's funny to say this to me, but we were joking even about our music, you know, and that, uh, at this age, we sound like our parents, like that ain't music. And we were laughing saying at some point there will be a generation of people to say, that ain't music. Migos, that's some real right. music, you know, <laughs> a little duff or whatever. That's some real music. And to us, we're like, I can't even imagine that day, you know? Um, so it's something interesting about, you know, the lines that start to crease your face, the gray hair to start to creep up on you. I mean, honestly, I think I'm here now. Maybe I'm premature. I don't know. But, like, <laughs> I'll say in college, all throughout college, I used to love listening to Future. But then by the time I turned, like, 24 and I actually was listening to what he said, I'm like, wait, wait, I don't agree with none of this. Like, <laughs> yeah. like he still makes good music, but yeah. it, it's not feeding me or, like, where I'm at. And what I'm trying to evolve to is just it, it doesn't match. Yeah. So I feel you. You know, when you talked about healing initially, let, let me just say that I love the brothers. I mm -hmm. love black Absolutely. men. I think in terms of our community, like, what is, like, the world, the question, like, what would the world be without black women? What would the world be without brothers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Um, there is something beautiful and magical and complicated and nuanced with all that in terms of our being. But when you talked earlier about the healing, I honest to God believe that literally in terms of when we're thinking about the liberation of our community, I literally believe that that rests in this um, this this relationship between men and women. Mm. I think that literally if if sisters, if black men and black women, we ever were able to move beyond to this next stage to be able to love each other, love ourselves and love ourselves deeply, ain't nobody going to be able to stop us. I fundamentally have seen that. I think our survival through all those phases of our being has been that. And that's what I, I believe. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think uh, it takes... Both. I want us to focus, though, on the right. bigger picture. I am not your enemy, brother. You know, right. like I, I love you enough to be able to tell you this is what I'm going through. And you have to love me enough to stand beside me and fight some of these battles. But we also have to not see them as our enemy either. I agree. And so Agreed. and we also have to see them as as we're teaching each other, because I think that there's a particular kind of frame in our community um, that we're not really honest about that. And. Being powerful doesn't mean we emulate what, like, I think there's on some level we think to be powerful. If I can run as many men, men as a men are running women, then that makes me your equal. Yeah. Right? Or no, that may, now maybe, maybe you just equally foolish, right? Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the truth of the matter equally is lonely, equally, equally lonely, equally lonely, equally damaged. dangerous, damaging. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think that there's, there, there's something around us really peeling back kind of this, what what we have seen about each other mm -hmm. um, and and be willing to give each other grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A grace and space to really learn and create this black love. Thing. Yeah. I think it's a lot of layers to pull back, but I do think that conscious conversations are happening and we are slowly getting there. But also I think what's interesting, or also I think um, because we have been dispersed in so many places. Some of us are in America, some of us are from the Caribbean, some of us are from Africa. We all kind of have different cultural upbringings. And I feel like because we have different backgrounds, different traumas, different standards of living, it's kind of hard to like integrate with one another. Mm -hmm. Where right. like other cultures, the whole family lives in the house and actually the cousins and the whole block kind of yeah. lives the same type of way. Multi generational. So because our community, like though you know skin folk ancient kin folk type type vibe like mm -hmm. because our community we might look alike but because we all live such different lives it's hard to get on the same page sometimes so you know i, I want to talk about that because um i think there are things changing in our community right um well i'll start with um our relationships with each other as women i think i i could sit here and and tell you guys 
um, you know, maybe I got beef with somebody, you know, like maybe there is a woman out there that I just don't rock with her. She don't rock with me. And I can sit here and tell you, I don't rock with her and she don't rock with me. And that's it. But I promise you, when we go out in this world, that's my sister and I rock with her and I'm going to fight for her and I'm going to die for her because she's a part of this community. I always want us to maintain that superpower. Mm -hmm. I think about the ways that we are progressing and getting away from some of those things. Now, not everybody is Christian. Not everybody goes mm -hmm. to church all the time. But if I were to say to y'all right now, God is good, you would say all the time. All the time. And if I were to say all the time, you would say God, God is good. good. That's my point. <laughs> we got a secret language that they don't even know and they don't understand. And so as we get away from things like going to church, I don't go to church. all the time. I, I, to be honest, with you, I ain't been to church in decades. Grandma, forgive me. I ain't been to church in so long. But there is that was such a defining part of our right. community. Yeah. Um, you know, hair salons and all, like, all these things that I think we, um, to your point about emulation, emulating men and then we want to emulate the white man's wealth mm -hmm. we want to get away from some of our to look down on some of our traditions of, of what we've done and i'm just trying to hold on to those this is part of the reason why i have conversations like this i want to hold on to the things that that made us survive this 400 year nightmare that we are yeah. still trying to fight our way through so from you all I'm curious if there is a defining piece of our history or our story that helps define who we are as black women. And it, could, it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. like a general, but like in your specific life, this was a moment that defined my black womanhood for me. It could be when you were doing the soul trade line, breaking your back, <laughs> um, you know, but what that moment was, I'll, I'll come to you and I'll, I'll come to you next, Nyla. You know, I, I think I look at it as... Um, uh, evolution. I all I grew up always feeling like there was somewhere I was supposed to be. It was almost like I'm, I'm getting on a train and I don't know where the next step I'm supposed to be. And I'm supposed to finish college. I'm supposed to get married. I'm supposed to find the right man. All of those things. And at some point, I remember, believe it or not, it was looking at an Oprah clip. Um, I remember looking at the network and and I was 40. I was actually, I was 39. I was getting ready to turn 40. And I was devastated that I wasn't married. It's like I was like, oh shit, I forgot to get married. <laughs> like, like yeah. and I was and I made it mean something. It meant it's something, it, it was something about that it took away from my womanhood because I wasn't chosen. Mm -hmm. And nobody chose me. And I remember this feeling, and I remember in this interview, the long story short, I remember in the interview, Oprah was asked the question, Will you die a unmarried woman? And it was mm -hmm. and it was made, it was said in a provocative way. And I remember the sister said, Yes. And what was interesting was the first time in my life I had seen a woman who actually like like loved and dated men mm -hmm. to actually own her identity that was her identity wasn't defined because of her relationship in a marriage or a man. And so that was an evolutionary moment for me. That one being able to acknowledge and hold that I want a partner, that I want a husband, that I want to be in a marriage mm -hmm. um, and a family, but that in itself does not define me as a woman was an evolutionary moment for me. Mm. Um, for me, I would have to say it would probably be when I, I got hired as a DJ because when I first got hired, I was the first female DJ hired and I was young. I was like 25. Everybody there is 35 plus and have been DJing since before I was born. So they just didn't really respect um, what I brought to the table, nor did they value my opinion. And when we would have meetings, you know, I would make suggestions. They would over talk me. They'd act as if I didn't say anything. And um, even uh, one time I got pulled aside and they told me, like, you know, you got hired, but you're just supposed to sit there and, like, watch and listen. Mm -hmm. You're not actually supposed mm -hmm. to contribute to the conversation. And, you know, that that really offended me because I almost believed it. But then yeah. it's like, that is not why I got hired. And yeah. that's why I like, you know, wearing hairstyles like Bantu knots and just doing things unapologetically black as fuck because it's like, you are not going to silence me. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I refuse, like, where I'm at right now, and that's a story from like five years ago. This is from earlier this week. I went to Dunkin' Donuts. I'm getting a, a bagel, strawberry cream cheese. <laughs> they give me a bagel with regular cream cheese. I'm like, I asked for strawberry. They're like, we don't have it. I'm like, okay, give me my money back. Then the guy goes to the back and then hands me the strawberry cream cheese. Now, the only reason why I'm so frustrated is because you literally just tried to shoo me away 
when I paid my hard-earned money. And yeah. I know it's so simple. It's like $1.90, but it's just the principle that, and that's why I say resilience, because it's like, you literally have to fight for everything. Even the shit you're paying for, they will give you a hard time for yeah. it. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. So. Yes, that's my that's <laughs> defining said. moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I want to close out this conversation by asking each of you um, to send your love letter to our sisters, to our mm-hmm. black women. Um, Nyla, we'll start with you on this one, and then we'll go to Latasha. But it, what, what, what's your message to to our our sisters? I don't know if I'm gonna be any good at this. And side note to Ari. If, if Ari Lennox is listening, girl, you look great, and I'm glad. I know that's right. Like, beautiful. You, you beautiful. You look beautiful. So good. Yeah. So, um, and then I love how she went from zero to 100, uh, classy to ratchet when that person threw a water bottle at her this week. I just, I totally <laughs> loved it, man. Big fan. But my love letter would just to be, um, you are beautiful. Don't let anybody take your confidence. This world, at every step of the way, which I tell you, you can't do something, but just know that you can. Because that's just, that's what we're made of. We're resilient. My love letter would be, sister, you are enough. You are whole and complete. You don't need anything or anybody to validate your presence on this earth. You are deserving, not because of what degree you have or where you live or how much money your family. You are deserving because you are here, that your presence is enough. And at the end of the day, know that the greatest love that you will ever tap into will be the love that you generate for yourself. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, I, I will close with uh, quoting um, someone, Aaron Haynes, who is a, a writer, um, someone we, we know well, um, a brilliant writer. And she called me because she was working with a, an executive coach. And she said, you know, I just wrote my personal manifesto. I said, oh, I want to hear it. And she read this to me and I got choked up. Um, Because it was so beautiful. Um, And so I want to share it with with you all. Um, She says, I speak truth to power always. I am a witness. I come on behalf Mm -hmm. of every black woman who has ever and will ever live so that they know we have always mattered and will always matter. Nothing happens without us. We make things better because we must. This spoke to me so much um, because... We make things better because we must. And I want to say to you all, you all have made my life better. Um, Collectively, we will make the world a better place. Um, But we also deserve to bring that energy back into ourselves and uplift ourselves. And I think what's a, a piece of advice you gave me, when we become love, we attract love, we omit love. And that's what I wish for my sisters. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We will have many, many, many more conversations like this um, that vary on different topics from marriage to sex to dating to finances to money to healthcare to menopause to what your body goes through every single decade. So I invite you to join us back here every week on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you next time.